Okay. So our speaker today is Elaine Mills. Elaine is a member of the 2012 Master Gardener Training Class and has a special interest in sustainable landscaping with a focus on native plants. She created the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants that are a popular resource on our MGND website. She has spent 10 years growing and photographing native plants and enjoys selecting pictures from her photo library to illustrate her talks, articles, short videos, and daily educational posts for MGND social media. Since 2017, she has been one of the coordinators for our Glenn Carlin Demonstration Garden. So I will turn over to you, Elaine, to start your presentation. Thank you very much, Julie, and thank you also to Aista, who's helping behind the scenes. Welcome everyone to today's talk uh, next in our sustainable landscaping series. I was interested looking back through my online calendar to note that I first gave this talk back in the fall of 2017 to a small group uh, in person. Uh, since that time, I have certainly learned about many more native plants and grown quite a few of them. So I'll be excited to share that new knowledge with you today. We'll begin by considering some reasons why you might consider adding the so-called graminoids, the, this category of herbaceous plants, to your home landscape. I'll talk about the basic characteristics of each type of plant, the grasses, sedges, and rushes. And then we'll discuss a sampling of native grasses and the grass-like sedges and rushes. We'll point out their unique characteristics, their benefit to wildlife, and suggest some companion plants and particular landscape uses. I'll point out uh, some tips on plant care, and we'll finish with notes on resources, locations where you might see some of these plants, and sources for purchasing them. So why grasses, sedges, and rushes? Well, first of all, they are generally easier to maintain than other garden plants. First of all, they're adapted to less fertile soils, which is going to mean reduced inputs as far as fertilizers. They have a deep root systems. This allows many of them to be drought tolerant once they've become established. And additionally, they're real workhorses in the garden. They will help stabilize soil and take care of maintaining control of uh, storm water. They're not going to require the staking, the deadheading, or the mowing that many of our other garden plants require. And although just about any plant can be eaten by deer at some point, this category of plants is generally unpalatable to deer. The, this category of plants provides multi-season interest. They have attractive foliage, flowers, and seed heads. They're quite a nice backdrop right now for flowering plants and fall foliage. They have, as you can see from this background photo, architectural structure through the winter. They fulfill a very important role in the garden as far as supporting our wildlife. They will offer protection for the movement of small animals and habitat for nesting bumblebees in their stems. The seed heads provide food for songbirds and they additionally serve as larval host plants. Their foliage will be used by the caterpillar stage of our butterflies and moths. Graminoids can fill many garden roles. You can use them as specimen plants or in containers. You can combine them with other plants used as a ground cover, a filler under trees, and a contrasting plant with a row of shrubs. Some of them can be used as screens or hedges. They can be used in large groups or even entire meadows. They make a nice contrast to solid surfaces. You can create repetition and patterns throughout the garden. Some of them are especially useful in hot, dry conditions like hell strips, rock gardens, and xeriscapes. And other species, in contrast, are great for use in rain gardens or for erosion control. 
this category of plants can create real pleasures for the senses. The tall grasses especially create a real sense of movement in the garden with their light airy seed heads that will just catch the simplest breeze. They really bring a sense of liveliness and life to the garden. And along with that movement, you'll catch some rustling sounds. Grasses have many interesting textures, bristly, spiky, and airy. And although we generally think of grasses as green, they take on many different colors and some of them will change their foliage color throughout the season. While the sedges tend to be less colorful than the grasses, the foliage of even those plants can vary from lime green or chartreuse all the way through to blue green. One especially wonderful characteristic is the effect of light on these plants. It will uh, create a, a wonderful effect both with backlighting and raindrops, dewdrops, and ice and snow. Another interesting quality is that of transparency. You see the, the tall grasses in the foreground, and then you look through and get a sense of depth in your garden, seeing what else is in the background. So let's talk first about the native grasses. They are monocots and members of the Poaceae family. They can be either annuals or perennials, but I'll be discussing perennial species today. They will become dormant at the end of the growing season, but then, of course, come back again the next year. The grasses, like our, our turf grasses, are categorized as either cool or warm season plants, and I'll be discussing that further. They are generally abundant in dry, open habitats, and they grow in ever-increasing tufts, and the new shoots are referred to as tillers. As I mentioned, grasses can provide wonderful habitat for feeding, nesting, and sheltering of our local fauna. Native grasses have stems that are round or flat and hollow, as you see from the last line of this familiar mnemonic. They have swollen nodes or joints along the stems. The leaf blades are flat and the leaves are said to be two ranked. That means that they're occurring on opposite sides of the stem. The grasses have both leafy and floral stems and many of the flowers are quite showy. All of these plants are wind pollinated. They're not going to rely on our pollinators. And the fruit is called a grain and it's covered by two papery scales. Native grasses have very uh, sizable fibrous roots. As you can see from the diagram, they can measure six feet or more, uh, a great comparison with the turf or lawn grass in the far left corner. And as I mentioned, these very deep roots are going to stabilize the plant and the surrounding soil and they're going to help the plants absorb water and minerals. We'll begin looking at the cool season grasses. These are going to begin their growth early in the spring and grow, grow slowly over a long period. They'll continue that growth in the spring during the cool weather and a period of rain. So the foliage is actually going to be looking its best in late spring and early summer, and then the plant will go dormant but it still will retain a presence in your garden. So let's begin looking at some specific examples. The first is river oats, Chasmanthium latifolium. This is found throughout a good part of the Eastern United States. It's native to rich woods and stream banks and grows in upright clumps of about two to five feet in height. This is quite a vigorously spreading grass. It grows in sun to part shade and in fact is quite tolerant of shade and likes moist to wet soil. It has bamboo-like leaves and its outstanding characteristic is how the seed heads will change color through the growing season. The seed heads continue to change color even into the fall and then they can be cut uh, as very attractive additions to uh, dried plant arrangements. And although they'll become a bit tattered, they even will last on into March. 
They have many landscape uses. They can be combined with other plants in mixed borders, used for erosion control on slopes. If you're concerned about their somewhat aggressive spread, you can plant them in containers to control that. Our next uh, cool season grass is poverty oat grass, Danthonia spicata, which is found pretty much throughout the United States. It's native to open woods, dry prairies, and roadsides, and you'll see it as a clump forming plant about one to two feet in height. It has quite vigorous roots and will expand slowly from short rhizomes. It can grow in full to part sun and true to its name, uh, can grow in poor, dry, sandy, or rocky soil and tolerates drought. In fact, it will decline in soil that is overly fertile or in shade. Poverty oat grass has dense tufted foliage and delicate flower panicles. And the twisted older leaves will be retained for an interesting texture at the base of each clump. A local naturalist, uh, Rod Simmons, has been discussing this as a possible turf grass alternative, and it would prefer areas that have sparse vegetation uh, and few fallen leaves. Our next cool season grass is wavy hair grass, Deschampsia flexuosa. This grows uh, largely in Eastern Canada and is especially centered around the Great Lakes, but also on our East Coast from Maine to North Carolina in the mountainous areas. It's native to forest clearings, and it has a mounding arching habit, reaching about two to three feet in height with the flower heads. This grass is going to prefer part to full shade and moist soil. Although it will tolerate drought, it dislikes heat and humidity and is evergreen. Wavy hair grass has dense tufts of fine textured foliage, and these beautiful silvery inflorescences will appear in May. Birds feed on the seed. In my garden, I've uh, grouped it at the front of my wildlife garden in the shade. Here you can see it, and it's backed by golden alexander and white wood aster. And some other companion plants you might consider would be green and gold, hairy alum root, and Christmas fern. Our next cool season grass is bottle brush grass, Elemis hystrix, found in the eastern areas of North America, south to Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. This is native to open woodlands and is a clump forming plant about two to four feet in height. This can grow anywhere from sun to shade in dry to moist soil. And interestingly, unlike many of the other grasses, will tolerate heavy shade, and it grows well in my dry shade. Like the chasmanthium, the river oats, it has bamboo-like, strap-like leaves, and this uh, foliage provides nourishment for the northern pearly eye butterfly and a number of moth species. It's named for these distinctive inflorescences, and birds will eventually eat the grain-like seed. Another plant that has very interesting seed heads that change through the season. Here's how it looks now. And this plant is especially effective when planted in a colony. Here's how I've used it in a woodland setting more as a specimen plant. It's backed by my gray dogwood and is bordered by Indian pink and dwarf crested iris. We'll move on now to the warm season native grasses. These, as I've mentioned, have very large root systems. And unlike the cool season grasses, these are going to begin growing when the daily temperatures are between 60 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And then they will grow rapidly during a relatively short period. So the growth will be happening during the summer months. They will flower and fruit in the fall, and then they will go dormant after the first frost but they can continue to provide an architectural presence in the garden, even in that dormant state. And with these plants, you'll want to avoid excess shade and water. The first, uh, a low growing plant is purple lovegrass, Aragrosta spectabilis. And it's located in scattered locations throughout the Eastern United States, native to open ground. It has a softly mounding habit and reaches anywhere from one to three feet in height. It prefers full sun, 
dry to moist soil and will tolerate both drought and salt. It begins its growth with blue-green basal leaves, and these will provide nourishment for the Zebulon skipper. Then in July, you'll begin to first see signs of the inflorescence developing. And by August, it will develop into a complete cloud of pale green panicles. Then in late summer, you'll see these lovely rosy purple flower spikelets. And these are absolutely gorgeous, especially with the effect of raindrops. I've seen this used en masse in meadows where it creates a lovely purplish haze. It can also be used as an edging plant. Here it's in the drier perimeter of a rain garden. And Arlington County, locally in Virginia, has been using it in some roadside planters. Another landscape use might be in a meadow. Here it's the grass creating that lovely tan haze and the birds will forage on these tan seed heads. Interestingly, the seed heads will actually detach from the plant and begin tumbling around beginning in November. And this leads to the alternative name of the plant, tumble grass. Our next warm season grass is pink muley grass, Muhlenbergia capillaris. This is native along the East Coast from Virginia to Florida and West to Kansas, Oklahoma and uh, Eastern Texas. This is native to prairies and it has a very distinctively rounded crown of about two to three feet in height. It will grow in sun to part shade and dry to moist soil. It's drought tolerant and very intolerant of winter wetness. This may be a problem for some people when the, the roots become very wet and may even rot out. That can cause loss of the plant. Pink muley grass has arching glossy leaf blades and then these beautiful rosy red plumes, very airy, will develop from uh, September to November. So the plant is quite showy right now in my garden. And then you'll continue to see the tan seed plumes on into the winter. Pink muley grass is one that uh, is especially beautiful with these different effects of light. In the distance, you get a sense of a cloud or a haze. And then up close, the, the inflorescences give the effect of children's sparklers. Pink muley has multiple landscape uses. It's very effective as a specimen plant and it will attract beneficial insects such as lady beetles. It can also be used as a hedge and there it will provide cover for birds and perching places for butterflies. It's also beautiful when interplanted in drifts with perennials. Our next grass is switchgrass, Panicum virgatum, uh, native throughout much of the United States. This grass is probably the one that I see the most frequently uh, available uh, in the horticultural trade. And it uh, is one of four grasses that were native to our Midwestern tall grass prairie, but it's also found in fields, open woods, and stream banks. It's a clumping grass with a vase-shaped habit. And as I mentioned, typical of the uh, warm season grasses it has a very extensive root system. It can reach anywhere from three to six feet in height and two to three feet wide. It grows in sun to part shade and moist soil. It can tolerate drought and you definitely want to avoid excess shade and excess water. Switchgrass has a very strong multi-season presence. The photograph on the left shows it when it's just beginning its growth, but uh, it will eventually develop uh, arching green leaves that uh, are a half inch wide and 30 inches long. This foliage uh, provides nourishment to skippers and satyrs. And this is a look at the very characteristic airy pink tinged flowering spikes. Those will begin showing up in July. And then in the winter, you'll continue to see these tawny persistent seed heads. The plant will provide cover and food for birds at that time. Switchgrass is a very versatile landscape plant. It can be used as an edging for paths. 
at our Glen Carlin demonstration garden, we use it as a specimen plant in the archway of the neighboring library building. You can use it uh, for underplanting beneath trees. This is a large rain garden. It can be used in the outer uh, circle, the perimeter of rain gardens and on slopes for erosion control. It's very effective for screening. It has a distinct architectural presence in mixed beds, even through the winter. And it's certainly a staple of meadows. There are many cultivars of switchgrass and they vary greatly in height and coloration. Shenandoah, which is one of the, the shorter cultivars, is very distinctive in that it takes on the burgundy color to some of the foliage in the fall. And it's been used in both street side plantings and around uh, community centers in uh, locally here in Arlington, Virginia. Our next warm season plant is little blue stem, Schizoperium scoparium, again, found throughout much of the United States. It is another of the plants that's native to the tall grass prairie, as well as fields and open woods. It has a clumping habit with very erect stems, about two to four feet tall. And it definitely prefers sun and dry conditions. And again, you would want to avoid shade and excess water. This plant has interesting foliage color changes throughout the season. True to its name, you'll begin seeing slender blue-green leaves in the spring. Then as the stems develop, uh, it will take on different shades of lavender and it provides a support for our wildlife, both as a host to skippers and as wildlife cover. Then as we move on into the fall, the foliage will take on a brown to rust color and persist through the winter. Here's a look at the inflorescences and the seed heads. First, the flowers in August, then a close-up look at the beautiful silvery white seed heads and how lovely they are, appear backlit by the sun. This shows you how lovely it continued to appear in the winter time in my garden and the seeds are enjoyed by songbirds. Little blue stem has many landscape uses. It can be used as an accent plant, interspersed with perennials in a mixed border, used in a rock garden or xeriscape, or in the perimeter of a rain garden. Additional landscape uses, here, uh, it's very dramatic and effective as a mass uh, monoculture planting. It can be used on slopes to control erosion. And it's uh, an important part of the structural layer in meadows. Our next warm season grass is Indian grass, Sorgastrum newtons, found throughout much of the United States. This is a third of those uh, species native to the tall grass prairie. And it has a clumping habit with a very upright form, ranging from three to five feet in height. Like the little blue stem, it prefers full sun and dry conditions and tolerates rocky soil drought and our urban condition of air pollution. As with the other warm season grasses, you want to avoid shade and very rich soil. Indian grass has arching blue-green foliage uh, that will be a host to the uh, pepper and salt skipper. And then it takes on these lovely pastel shades in the fall. The stems provide both nesting for native bees and cover and nesting sites for birds. Then these lovely feathery panicles will appear from September and continue on into the winter and there's a lovely metallic sheen to the seed heads. These will provide seed for birds. As far as landscape uses, Indian grass can help control erosion on slopes. It uh, provides a vertical accent in borders or meadows. Here it is backing the grass that I showed earlier, the uh, purple love grass. 
And it, it also is very nice paired with our perennials such as butterfly weed, purple coneflower, and black-eyed Susans. And as I showed from that very first uh, photograph at the beginning of the talk, it maintains an upright habit into the winter. I've become aware of sea oats, uniola, uniola paniculata, as I've been making trips to the beach in the summer. So this plant is native to dune habitats uh, in coastal areas anywhere from the eastern shore to Florida and then west around the Gulf of Mexico to Texas. It has very deep tap roots and lateral rhizomes as well to help it uh, hold the dunes together. It reaches four to six uh, feet in height and prefers sun and dry sandy soil. It tolerates quite a few of the beachside conditions, blowing sand, drought, and brief inundation of salt water. In fact, the constant blowing of sand actually stimulates the growth, uh, strong growth of this plant. Unfortunately, it is now threatened both by urbanization, foot traffic, and off-road vehicles. Sea oats have stemless leaves, they're narrow and tapering, and reach about 18 inches in length. It has these lovely seed heads with flat oval scaly spikelets, and those seeds will be eaten by birds, and we can find them very attractive in dried flower arrangements. The most important landscape use for sea oats, of course, is for preventing damage to dunes during storms. Prairie drop seed, Sporobolus heterolepis, is principally found in Canada and in uh, the United States up in our upper Midwest. It's only uh, native to one county, Franklin County in Virginia, but it does grow well in our area. This particular photograph was taken at Brookside Gardens in Maryland. It's native to prairies, barrens, and open woodlands and has a clump forming habit reaching about two to three feet in height. It prefers sun and dry soil and will actually tolerate rocky and gravelly soil and extreme drought. You'd want to avoid shading it by taller plants. Prairie drop seed has dense arching tufts of foliage and these will turn golden and retain their shape through the winter. You'll see these fragrant uh, flowers that will be blooming from June to August and then the seeds develop and are relished by songbirds. As far as landscape uses, it's quite attractive as a distinctive border plant, can provide ground cover for trees and shrubs, and is quite effective when used en masse for erosion control. A few tips on the care of native grasses. As I mentioned at the outset, these are going to generally require little uh, attention on your part throughout the year. It's best to plant the grasses in the spring, allowing them plenty of time for those deep root systems uh, to develop and thereby avoid frost heave in the fall and winter. As I've mentioned multiple times, you want to avoid excess shade and water for the warm season species to prevent the, the drooping of the plants. And of course, it's a good idea to retain these plants through the winter, both for ornamental interest and architectural structure, and of course, benefit to our wildlife. Moving on into the spring, that's when you would cut down those old dried stems to about four to six inches. And you can remove those cut pieces from the crown and just simply place them as mulch uh, or compost around the plant. To propagate them, you would simply lift and split them in the early spring with some of the, the larger plants like the, the switchgrass and uh, the Indian grass. You might need to use uh, two garden forks to actually pry those, those large bases apart. And you can certainly interplant them with spring bulbs and ephemerals before they, they take on the, the growth for the rest of the season. Do we have any questions at this point, Julie? 
Yes, we do. We have several. So first of all, can you use native grasses over a septic bed given their deep roots? I think that would work acceptably. The roots would maybe just go a little bit more to the side, but I can look further into that and provide information when I provide the captioning uh, for the recorded version of the presentation, I always provide additional responses to questions that come up during the Q&A. So I'll look further into that. Should we fertilize grasses? And if so, what time of year is best? Native grasses are not going to require the fertilization that maybe some of our other plants need. In fact, they're going to prefer just our natural soil, not particularly rich. In their native growth habitat, they were growing simply in meadows and prairies, and so there wouldn't be any additional fertilization there. So that's a one step that makes growing these plants that much easier. Do grasses bring more snakes to your garden? I'm certainly not aware of that. The bases of some of the plants can, of course, provide hiding places for maybe some of the small mammals like little mice or chipmunks, but I'm not aware that snakes are particularly attracted to them. But again, I can look further into that. Which grasses work well in clay soil, uh, either in sun or shade? Clay soil tends to hold more moisture. So Maybe the cool season grasses might do a little better with those. Maybe the purple love grass, I think, would do quite well. Should grass seeds that are winter sown be stratified? I have to admit that I grow the grasses from plants. They can be grown in several different ways, from seed, from plugs, or from potted plants. And I can find out exactly what's involved with the, the growing of these plants from seed. One resource that I have found particularly helpful with regard to all of that information about such techniques as cold weather stratification is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center site. It's best to enter the scientific name of the plant and my handout will give you both the scientific and common names of all of these plants. You can enter that in and when you scroll down toward the bottom of the detailed description of the plant, you'll see exactly how the seed should be treated uh, prior to use. If grasses have such deep roots, how far down do we need to go to split and propagate? I've found that there may be a couple feet down. I've mainly done the, the dividing within the first several years of the growth. They're going to begin widening some of these fairly substantially. So you may be able to divide them both to spread throughout your garden or to share with others fairly early in their growth, and then let that initial base continue to grow down deeper. When you advise that some grasses don't like wet, does that mean that they won't do well in our mid-Atlantic climate with our rain patterns? That is a challenge that we're facing now with climate change. I have found, for example, that my little blue stem got battered down. It's partly the beating down uh, from these heavy storm events. Uh, I've learned in, in my research for a talk I gave on climate conscious gardening that the rain is actually hitting at maybe 25 miles an hour. So it can batter some of the grasses down. But if you can find the best spot in your garden for the grasses that prefer the dry soil, so maybe the water will run off. Perhaps they could be raised up a little bit and the rain could, could flow off. That would help. There are certain cultivars, particularly I'm thinking of the little blue stem. One is referred to as standing ovation. And some of the cultivars supposedly have been found to uh, retain more of the erect habit. Can you say more about dividing, age of plants, size to divide, et cetera? Okay, I'm thinking about a, a plant like, let's say, the switchgrass. I was dividing it when it was maybe about a foot to 18 inches across. And so the roots would be maybe a foot to 18 inches deep. 
and spring would be the time to do that. You want to divide them before they've really taken off with that new growth. Is dividing more effective in covering a large area? Yes, rather than just waiting for those tillers to develop, that could be a way of more quickly spreading the grasses over ground. If you want to cover a fairly large area from the outset, I would advise planting with plugs. They will have a pretty substantial root system to them already from the very beginning. That'll give you a jump start over growing them from seed, but it will be more economical than growing them from the potted plant, let's say quart to gallon size. And you would tend to plant them on about one foot uh, centers. Let's see, this is from a woman who is assisting a small historic cemetery with restoration work. And one southern side facing the street is on a very, very squinty high uh, slope. Mm -hmm. She noted increasing signs of erosion and wants to encourage the planting of grasses that help and require little maintenance. Do you have suggestions for shorter grasses that look tidy enough for the site? Okay, so I'm I'm assuming that maybe shorter, well, certainly shorter than the uh, Indian grass and the switchgrass. Little blue stem isn't quite as tall. Some of those will be maybe about two feet tall, and they're quite attractive. The pink muley grass won't really get as much growth underway. It's it's the most showy during the fall season. Purple love grass, of course, is the shortest of the, the sun preferring warm season grasses. I can reflect on that a little bit more and comment further in my addendum. Are there any studies on cultivars of grasses? Are they beneficial to the wildlife on similar level as straight species? Some of the cultivars are definitely more showy, desirable than the straight species, but our um, participant wonders about the benefits. The main problems I've learned about with cultivars occur with the shrubs and the other categories of herbaceous perennials, the so-called forbs. With shrubs, it's a question of the change in the chemistry of the leaves. When the foliage color changes, that then the leaves will no longer provide nourishment for that caterpillar stage, the larval stage of our butterflies and moths. With the forbs, the showy flowery herbaceous plants, it's a change to the flower structure and the flower color that are going to be problematic. With the grasses, I don't think there's as much of a change in that structure. I haven't become aware of any particular studies on grasses. The Mount Cuba Center, for example, has conducted many studies on different herbaceous plants and reports uh, comparing their use uh, by pollinators and, uh, and as host plants, I think primarily by use by pollinators, comparing the straight species of each plant, let's say a Coreopterus or phlox or echinacea, it'll compare with the straight species and a number of different cultivars and we'll compare them. But I haven't seen any studies on grasses. I can try to look further into that, but I don't think the grasses are affected in quite the same way that the other categories of plants are. We can move on now. Of course, there are many other native grasses. I've chosen just certain ones that I'm most familiar with and that will be most readily available in the horticulture trade. But we can move on now to take a look at our native sedges. Sedges are members of the Cyperaceae family, and a good many of them are in the Carex genus. Like the grasses, they're monocots, and they superficially resemble grasses. They're primarily perennials. They're mostly evergreen, cool season, and shade-loving plants and they tend to prefer moist to wet environments. They're clump forming in habit, and rather than having those very deep roots that many of the grasses have, they will spread by long rhizomes, which also make them useful in erosion control. So if some folks are looking for control of erosion on steep slopes, 
if the conditions are right, they may want to look at some of the sedges. And because they have these strong roots, sedges are very effective when used at the inflow point of rain gardens. They can withstand that quick, a powerful flow of the water as it enters the rain garden. Native sedges have stems that are cross sections and they appear triangular, as you'll recall from the sedges have edges mnemonic. Uh, the leaf blades may be folded rather than flat as with the grasses, and the base of the leaf is closed around the stem. And uh, unlike the grasses, which are two ranked, uh, the leaves of sedges are said to be three ranked and they're arranged spirally along the stem. Sedges uh, will have only floral stems and the flowers tend to be more inconspicuous. Like the grasses, the flowers are wind pollinated and the fruit is described as a nutlet. As I mentioned, the roots are rhizomes and they're going to be spreading laterally. The first sedge we'll look at is Pennsylvania sedge, Carex pennsylvanica, native to the eastern areas of North America, south to North Carolina and Tennessee, and west to Minnesota. This is native to thickets and dry woodlands. It grows in loose colonies and the individual plants will be about 6 to 12 inches high and wide. It grows in part to full shade and dry to moist soil, tolerating heavy drought and uh, heavy shade and is semi-evergreen. Here's a look at the individual plants. They have a fountaining habit with very fine textured grass-like foliage. The inflorescences appear in April with male and female spikelets, and it will take on a tawny color later in the season. I've seen Pennsylvania sedge grouped as an edging plant, and in my garden, I've combined it with other shade-loving perennials, such as marginal wood fern, wild geranium, sweet woodruff, and blue-eyed grass. Pennsylvania sedge is an ideal ground cover in dry shade because of its spreading by rhizomes. It can be used as a ground layer in woodland settings or can actually take on the look of lawn grass in a backyard where there is a shade and uh, turf grass won't grow. The one proviso is that you can't use it in quite the way you would a turf grass. It can't take that heavy foot traffic, certainly couldn't take dogs galloping across it, but it could be used very effectively as a ground cover. And I would suggest you might want to use something like stepping stones if you want to have a path going through that area. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, plugs planted on one foot centers would be the way to start establishing a more substantial ground layer. Our next sedge is Appalachian sedge, Carex Appalachica, native from New England to Georgia and west to Ohio, native to dry woods. And it grows in somewhat denser mounded tufts, six to 12 inches high and as much as 18 inches across. Again, it grows in part to full shade and dry to moist soil. It's drought tolerant and semi evergreen. It has a fountaining habit, again, very fine textured foliage, and this provides nourishment to skippers and satyr caterpillars. It has very delicate inflorescences that will appear in April to May, and the seed will provide food for both birds and turtles. It will take on tan edges in the wintertime. As far as landscape uses, I use it both as an edging plant underneath my shrubs, a great substitute for invasive liriope, and also as a ground cover with other shade loving plants around a tree with coral bells, wild ginger, and some other companion plants might be alum root, dwarf quested iris, eastern columbine, foam flower, and white wood aster. More landscape uses, a ground cover, on a slope for soil stabilization. And it's especially effective for uh, controlling erosion on the very steep slopes in our shady demonstration garden. One of my favorite sedges is plantain leaf sedge, Carex plantagenea. It's found in uh, scattered locations on the East Coast all the way from Maine to Tennessee and is especially prevalent around the Great Lakes. It's native to rich mountain woodlands it's a clump forming plant. 
about six to 12 inches high, and it can reach as much as two feet across. Again, it grows in part shade to full shade, and it prefers somewhat moister soil, although I have found it does quite well in dry shade once it's established. It's evergreen, and mine has even made it through winters with heavy snow and ice. Plant and leaf sedge will have its new leaves beginning to emerge in March. They have almost a, a lime green to chartreuse color, very unusual. You'll begin to see offsets from the main plant, an easy way to separate and spread it. And it can also spread through self-seeding, but not aggressively in any way. Plant and leaf sedge has very interesting strap-like puckered leaves with prominent veins about an inch wide, and this leads to its alternate common name, seersucker sedge. This will provide nourishment for woodland butterflies. It has these very interesting inflorescences in March. They have maroon and green striped culms, and the male and female spikelets, of course, will be pollinated by the wind birds will eat the seeds. I think of plant and leaf sedge as really the quintessential replacement plant for invasive liriope with its broad uh, strap-like leaves. And it's also a great companion plant uh, with other shade-loving species such as wild ginger, hairy alum root, and hostas. Our next plant, another very showy one, is gray's sedge, Carex grayi found in scattered locations in the eastern United States. This one is native to moist woods, marshes, and creek edges. Another clump forming plant, uh, somewhat taller, 30 inches tall, and about two feet across. It grows in part sun to part shade and prefers moist to wet soil. It can tolerate seasonal flooding and is semi-evergreen. Interestingly, the particular location where I have it planted gets fairly strong afternoon sun, a western exposure. It's not particularly moist at all, and yet it is quite uh, drought tolerant there. Gray sedge has this interesting a glossy pleated foliage, and its most interesting characteristic is the inflorescence, which consists of the male spikelet. You can see it rising uh, there diagonally above the two female spikelets, which are fairly large, about an inch or so across, and they look uh, something like medieval maces. Those will dry and turn brown, and then the seed clusters will spread seed either by wind or primarily by water. It has a number of landscape uses. As I mentioned, I use it as an accent plant. A master gardener colleague has a grouping of them. It's very effective as a mass planting, or it could be combined with other moisture loving plants such as cinnamon fern, cardinal flower, or great blue lobelia. Our next plant, I've just begun using this at Glen Carla uh, Demonstration Garden, is blue wood sedge, Carex flacosperma. This is native from New Jersey to Florida on the East Coast and then west to these other states. Like the preceding species, it's native to moist meadows and woodlands. It has a clumping habit. It reaches about six to 12 inches uh, tall and wide. Part shade to shade and moist to wet soil are its growing preferences. But again, it will be somewhat drought tolerant once established and it is evergreen. This sedge has distinctly a blue-green leaves. They're arching about one half inch wide. Here are the seeds, and this will spread by short rhizomes. Can be very attractive when grouped as a ground cover and another possible replacement for liriope. And one more sedge, Creek sedge, Carex amphibola. This will be found natively mainly from Pennsylvania to North Carolina, and then west to Oklahoma and as far as Eastern Texas. This again is native to moist locations with a clumping habit, uh, somewhat larger, uh, 12 to 18 inches tall and wide. It grows in part to full shade and moist to wet soil. It will tolerate sun if it is not allowed to dry out and is semi-evergreen. 
Creek sedge has arching glossy leaves. They're a foot long, but only about an eighth of an inch wide. And it will also serve as a larval host for skippers. You'll see the inflorescences in May, and then the seeds that develop will be eaten by turtles. Uh, it can be grouped for erosion control on slopes, swales, and in rain gardens. Like the grasses, native sedges require little annual attention. You can plant these either in the spring or the fall. Uh, they're essentially not going to need much care in the first season or two beyond simply combing or raking out the foliage. And you would want to remove those uh, dead leaves gently by hand and do that before the new growth is leaping out. And you can also cut them back and lift and split them at any time during their active growth. They will be much easier to, to split than the grasses. And finally, I'd like to take a look at a native rush. Rushes are members of the Juncaceae family. Again, they're monocots that superficially resemble the grasses and the sedges. They're primarily perennials. They're evergreen and tend to thrive in colder regions. They favor moist conditions such as pond edges and bogs, and they will spread by rhizomes. Their stems are round with a solid pith, unlike the round stems of the grasses. The leaves are usually found simply at the base of the stems, and they're arranged in spirals. And the fruits are described as three-chambered capsules with many seeds inside. So I have one example of a rush. This is the common or soft rush, Juncus effusus, scattered throughout the United States, uh, principally in the eastern half. And this plant is native to wetlands. It has a clumping vase shape, uh, somewhat taller than the sedges, certainly, uh, three to four feet in height and two to three feet wide. It grows in full sun and will definitely prefer saturated soil or even standing water up to four inches deep. It's evergreen. It has spire-like stamps without any leaves. You'll see these tawny inflorescences from June to August, and the seeds will be dispersed by either wind or water. Rush, uh, the soft rush can be used as an accent plant or in a container as long as a, enough moisture were provided. And here you see it used en masse in the center area of this rain garden. And it can also be used to control erosion on slopes. In Arlington County, it has a more formal use uh, right near our trade center. Uh, as far as resources for you, I wanted to let you know about how to get to information on the grasses and in fact, any of our native plants on our MGNB website. You would go to the plants menu they're under uh, tried and true native plants, and then uh, select grasses and sedges. And here's a look at our tried and true fact sheets. The handout that I've provided for you has hot links that will take you directly to these fact sheets. And these will give you even more information than I've been able to share in our time together today. And additionally, on these fact sheets, you will see how the native species can replace some of the invasive grasses. Uh, this particular example, we're showing how Indian grass can be a replacement for invasive miscanthus. On the back side of the handout, I've provided a few links and suggestions, some books. One has been recently updated. That's the Grasses, Sedges, and Rushes Identification Guide by Lauren Brown. And uh, there are a number of very interesting articles and blog posts, including several by Thomas Rainier, who is a locally prominent landscape designer. As far as where to see these native grasses in our region, if you live locally, please come and visit us at our Master Gardener Demonstration Gardens. You can see the locations for those on the MGNB website. Again, if you're local to Northern Virginia, you might want to see the grasses at Green Spring Gardens. 
Uh, there are many of them at Meadowlark Botanical Gardens, both in their woodland area and the meadow. They're also shown beautifully arranged in both natural and more orchestrated horticultural plantings in DC at the US National Arboretum and the outside National Garden at the US Botanic Garden. Brookside Gardens has a great number of native grasses shown. Even as you first arrive in their parking lot, you'll see numerous species and then they are also on the banks in a meadow area. Many folks want to know where to buy native grasses, and the best resource I'm aware of here for us locally is Plant Nova Natives. Their website lists both locations for native year-round nurseries as well as plant sales. For those of you who are attending in other regions of Virginia, you can refer to the comparable guides for the native plants in your region. I would suggest going to state native plant societies for those of you who might be attending from elsewhere to get suggestions on where to buy these types of plants. Do we have any final questions today? Can you comment on the limestone meadow sedge? That is one that I'm not familiar with. I have to admit that there are many sedges. In fact, I've recently attended a presentation that was on nothing but sedges in the Carex species. And that's one that unfortunately I'm not aware of, but I'll be happy to look further into that and provide some comments. You mentioned that dividing sedges is easier than dividing grasses. Where does dividing rushes fit in? I haven't looked into that, but I think they're going to have that same kind of vase-shaped uh, habit growing from one central point. And with that, of course, you wouldn't need anything as substantial as a garden fork, uh, just some, some simple tools. One of my preferred tools in the garden is called a hori hori knife, H-O-R-I. H-O-R-I. It's a, a Japanese gardening tool. I find it very handy. Uh, you can cut down and it has a serrated edge that will help you cut through the roots and separate them very gently. What is the best time of year for uh, dividing rushes? For rushes, again, I would suggest the springtime before it really takes off with its growth. Well, maybe like the sedges, you could do it during the, the active period of growth. As we've mentioned several times, this presentation is being recorded. I will be personally handling the closed captioning, so that should be done within just a few days. And we'll be posting this both on our website and our MGNV YouTube channel, should you want to refer to it again. Uh, I will be taking time to go back through the chat box. I will get a copy of that, and we'll look back through the questions and see if I can provide more substantial answers for those questions where I just had a, a brief comment. Thank you everyone so much for attending. I think you'll be really excited to start using some of these plants in your gardens, and I wish you all the best uh, over the winter season. And yes, thank you, everybody. The, the thank yous are pouring into the chat, Elaine. Once again, we appreciate your expertise and passion for native plants.